Thank you back, everybody. And uh, I'm only going to be here to briefly introduce uh, Horacio Lagras, who is a professor in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese, as also the former director of uh, Critical Theory Institute and Emphasis, or? In, it's the Institute, OK. Uh, that, that's why I'm combining it. Even I get confused. Um, and uh, they, of course, is a. Uh, uh, Horacio uh, is a PhD from Duke University um, and has taught at Georgetown before coming to UC Irvine and uh, works on a variety of questions in both Latin American literature, uh, Hispanic literature, uh, critical theory, and film. Uh, and of course, uh, well known for a book on literature and subjection. And, uh, He's just been uh, away for a year, and well, actually, that's now the year has been a year ago that you came back. So, anyway, we're pleased to have him back, and he'll uh, moderate this panel. Horacio, please. Okay, welcome to everybody, and thank you, George, for the introduction. So, um, I will follow uh, David's uh, model yesterday. So I will introduce first the panelists in the order that they will be speaking. Um, first, Peggy Camus, uh, who is the Marion Francis Chevalier Professor of French and Comparative Literature at the University of Southern California. Uh, she has uh, written extensively on French literature and culture. And she received the American Comparative Literature Association 2006 uh, René Gwelek Prize for her work, Book of Addresses. Professor Camus, uh, Camus is known uh, as one of the primary English translators of the work of Jacques Derrida. And she has also written extensively on Derrida and uh, her articles, uh, like span of 10 years of article, has been collected in the volume To Follow the Wake of Jacques Derrida. And she also has edited a number of, of volumes that collect Derrida's essays. More recently, she has undertaken, although not alone, uh, the monumental task of translating and publishing uh, Derrida's seminar. The last installment of that work uh, is the seminar on the death penalty that just came up from Chicago University Press. Uh, those uh, those interested in this uh, monumental project can visit the web page www.derridasseminar.org. Uh, our next panelist will be uh, Irving Go. Irving received his PhD in comparative literature from Cornell University in 2012, and he's currently a Mellon postdoctoral fellow at the Center of the Humanities and the Department of Romance Languages at Tufts University. He is the author of The Reject, Community, Politics, and Religion After the Subject, which was published by Fordham University Press uh, recently. Uh, he has also co-edited with uh, Berena Conley a number of essays, um, a volume of essays on the work of Jean-Luc Nancy, titled Nancy Now, uh, uh, published by Polity Press. And he's also the editor, uh, actually the co-editor, of two special issues of diacritics on the work of Jacques Lugnancy. Uh, then uh, we go to Xu Dong Chang. He's professor of East Asian Studies and Comparative Literature at NYU. He is the author of several books, Chinese Modernism in the Era of Reform, published, I believe, only two years after completing his PhD, if I am not mistaken. Uh, he's the author also of Post-Socialism and Cultural Politics, The Last Decade of China's 20th Century. He edited and co-edited a number of volumes on China, and he has also published a, a, a substantial uh, you know, number of uh, books in Chinese. Uh, among them are The Order of the Imaginary, Critical Theory and Modern Chinese Literary Discourse, and Traces of Criticism, Essays on Theory and Cultural Politics. And also, I want to mention Cultural Identity in the Age of Globalization, uh, which was published in 2005 and went through a re-edition a year later in 2006. Uh, our last panelist, uh, well, I will start by saying this. When George sent me an email with the information about this panel, he referred to the last panelist as our own Rada. And I love the expression. Um, <laughs> 
Rayagopalan uh, Radhakrishnan is Chancellor's Professor of English and Comparative Literature at UCI. He is also core faculty of African American Studies, core faculty of the PhD program in Culture and Theory, and affiliated faculty with the Department of Gender and Sexualities. He's the author of several books, among them, oh, I, I will mention just the, the, the latest ones. Uh, Diasporic Mediations Between Home and Location was published by University of Minnesota Press in 1996. Theory in an Uneven World appeared in 2003. Between Identity and Location, The Cultural Politics of Theory was published in India in 2007. History, the Human and the World Between appeared with Duke University Press in 2008, and Edward Said, a dictionary, was published by Blackwell in 2012. He is also a poet, a translator, and the recipient of a number of distinctions, both in the US and in India. Now, going. This one's a Mahatma Gandhi prize. Yeah, he, uh, this is a big deal. He <laughs> just won the. Uh, I, for go. And, 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 and he will receive the prize in London. And we were discussing with Rada if this was a case of colonialism or reverse colonialism. Um, uh, regarding the question, you know, the question is, first, the title of the, the panel is Recognizing Theory. Is, no? Oh, I don't have the title before me, but I believe you. Um, recognizing Critique. <laughs> and the question is, is critical theory today a recognizable genre, style of thinking, writing? If so, what are its most salient features? If not, what should count as an instance of critique, theory, theorizing? Are there other kinds of intervention into the public space, into the public space of appearance that could count as critical and or theoretical? And I want to say a few things about this question. In my view, the question asks for a certain consistency or form of appearance of, a criti of critical discourse, but it, uh, but it also assumes a diffusion of the generic identity of that discourse. Yesterday, Gabi Schwab reminded us about a conference held at UCI whose initial title was The Future of Theory, but which was changed to the futures of theory at the request of Charles Derrida. Now, with the Derridian logic, we should say that if we have to talk about the futures of theory in the plural, we should, by the same token, also speak about the past of theories in the plural. Mm -hmm. This issue of plur plurality was raised in the morning discussion with Hillis Miller about the nature and, and, and function of the archive. At some point, a question emerged about the genealogy of critical theory, and Jonathan Kaller, I believe, introduced some plurality into the account by reminding the audience that there was already some theory at work in the 1950s, uh, you know, under the names of uh, Abrams and Northern Fry. And of course, we can push the argument even further to include people like Jean Mukarowski, the Circle of pra Prague, or the encounter between phenomenology and philology in the Geneva School. We could also press the matter in the direction of a more consistent and radical plurality. I want, however, however, to push the argument in a different direction by reminding you of another moment of our discussion yesterday that took place at the 13.30 uh, o'clock panel, Is Theory Critical? Martin, who is not here today, posed the panel a very simple question. What should we be reading? Although the question was directed to the panel, I am sure that most of us went through some ruminations in our heads. What would my answer be to such a question? The fact of the question is inextricable from its form. Martin phrased his question as a matter of duty and also as a matter of urgency. When Gayatri Spivak answered Du Bois, we should be reading Du Bois, Black Reconstruction, something inside me jump with an, of course, this is what we should be reading. Hmm? I came across Black Reconstruction only a few months ago in a reading group organized by Nahum Chandler, along with a doctoral student in the Department of Anthropology. And I recall the profound impression that this text had on me. 
It was a dazzling account of how the masses affect the course of history outside the liberal parameters of opinion or possessive individualism. An account of how the underdogs read the situation and act on a situation according to logics of mapping that remain puzzlingly unreadable for most of us. But it was not political sympathy that commanded my enthusiasm. I was struck by everything that was strictly critical and theoretical in Du Bois's book. At the meeting, I told Nahum, we should all be reading this. I mean by that, we all in the humanities, we all at UCI. And I phrased my opinion exactly as Martin phrased his question, as a matter of urgency and as a matter of duty. And yet, when the question of the archive and the genealogy of critical theory came up yesterday in the morning, I thought of alternate genealogies. This is what you know, post-colonialists do. I thought of Mukarovsky. I thought of Franz Fanon, but I didn't recall black reconstruction whose reading and study had seemed so urgent to me just a couple of months ago. Neither did this reference came to my mind when Martin asked his question. What I want to suggest is that this forgetting, personal as it is, is also an index of how our archive is constructed, our ur urgencies are established, and how we go around imagining something called critical theory. So the question is, under what institutional, critical, and political conditions, and these are, condi you know, these are not uh, conditions of our own making, hmm, to say it with Marx. Under what institutional, critical, and political conditions can black reconstruction occupy the place that it intrinsically deserves as one of the greatest theoretical works of the 20th century? And what I want to suggest is that perhaps in the possibility of imagining a plural past lies a form of a school for imagining also a plural future, which in some, in several senses, I believe may be the subject uh, of this panel. So I will introduce, um, I will invite uh, first uh, Professor uh, Peggy Kamuth uh, to start her Gener five minutes, but you know, <laughs> generous five minutes. Um, I may even be less than five minutes. <coughs> um, thank you, George, for, and all of your team for organizing this, for bringing us together. Um, it's so far been really uh, very thought provoking. Um, I imagine, well, ha I, I feel as if I'm going to have a lot more to say after this conference than I did before. <laughs> so, and I'm afraid that that gets um, sort of indicated by the paucity of these remarks. Um, because I suspect that someone or something, maybe it's a machine, thinking yesterday of Catherine's talk about ex machina. Um, uh, someone or something is having a little fun by convoking us with the questions for this panel, the ones that Horatio just read. But I'm going to read them again. Is critical theory today a recognizable genre slash style of thinking slash writing? If so, what are its most salient features? If not, what should count as an instance of critique slash theory slash theorizing? Are there other kinds of intervention into the public spaces of appearance that could count as critical and or and slash or theoretical? It occurred to me that these questions <laughs> might be trying to give an example of what they are asking about. That is a recognizable style of critical theory writing. In these 47 words, four words are in quotation marks, what we call scare quotes. There are five forward slashes and a pair of parentheses in the phrase, which is also in scare quotes, spaces of, space as of appearance. I'm not even sure what that means, by the way, in either the singular or the plural, but <coughs> well, this, this uh, is a rather idle hypothesis, but um, 
if it if it's valid at least for under five minutes, how does the ex the example of these questions exemplify this style? So first of all, perhaps the use of so-called scare quotes. Um, to the point that one may even begin to wonder why all the words, or at least all the nouns, um, in these few lines are not treated to this extra adornment. Why some nouns rather than others? Uh, since there are so many of them. There are only 47 words in, in this little, not all of them nouns, of course, so <clears throat> why do we use scare quotes here and not there? Um, but scare quotes in general, this I call it an extra adornment, uh, calls attention to what a word is supposed to mean or not, gives us warning to suspect something about the word. It's a tool of that hermeneutics of suspicion that Jeff reminded uh, in, in Ricoeur's phrase. So that's one. Two, in general, the fussiness of the typography slash punctuation weds this genre slash style of thinking slash writing to spatial inscription mm -hmm. that is transposed only approximately into the temporal medium of speech as my kind of histrionics would. I was reminded of Victor Borga. Does anyone know the Victor yeah. Borga sketch of, of yeah. kind of yeah. how you yeah. speak punctuation? Mm -hmm. It's hilarious. It's, I'm sure it's on YouTube somewhere. Um, uh, so this only approximately temporal medium of, of speech that can um, kind of uh, uh, attempt to mime um, these uh, uh, punctuation. So theory slash critique slash theorizing, whatever else they may be, need to be encountered in that experience called reading, whatever that is. And then third, the third point is the question of the question. Um, does so-called critical theory mobilize questions in a distinct manner? Um, I don't know, it's a question. Um, since my friend, George Vantanabili, has assured me that he has no particular interest in this language as formulated, um, it might have indeed been written by a machine. Um, I won't hesitate to say that I think this example of theory writing slash thinking is a bad example. That it even approaches someone's idea of a parody of the bad writing that theorists are supposedly guilty of all the time. Um, well, to conclude these very brief remarks, I don't think one should want to be able to answer the question, which is one of the questions posed. I don't think one should want to be able to answer it. What should count as an instance um, and so forth? What should count as an instance of critique slash theory slash theorizing? Because if one could answer that question, then it would be over. All its traits defined, nothing left to come, nothing that will surprise or interrupt. Thank you. Well, um, well I'm, I'm going to answer the question, what, what is the stadium feature of theory? So, um, well, to me, um, the stadium feature of theory, or what makes theory theory, and I don't mean only theory today, but theory as uh, we know it, is what I would call theory's prepositionality. And by prepositionality, I mean two things. Uh, firstly, of a preposition. And I'm, here, I'm just going to say it's a preposition to, or I in French. And I, I'm, I'm referring to the French language simply because um, I'm more inclined towards uh, contemporary French thought than, say, uh, German or Italian thought. But, I mean, yesterday we have already heard zu um, uh, and one could add also zu Hang and also sein zum Tode, right? So that's, that's the notion of the two in, in German too. And secondly, um, by prepositionality, I also mean um, preposition, okay? Um, so let me deal with the preposition first. Okay, so the preposition two 
um, one could say that the Proposition 2 has uh, a kind of marked appearance in recent uh, French thought. And I think a striking example would be uh, in the writings of Jacques Derrida. Uh, Derrida, who has uh, rewritten or reinscribed uh, L'Avenir, which is the future, as a venir, that is to say the preposition a hyphen venir. And one must trans one then translates um, a future into the to come. And um, this, this to come has found its reiterations in other Derridean tropes, such as democracy to come, uh, hospitality to come, justice to come. Um, one could also find it in, in the works of uh, Louis Ihigahai, uh, particularly in her book, uh, J'aime à toi, um, which is a kind of, um, one could say, a more archaic way of saying je t'aime. So the more literal translation of that title would be I love to you, rather, rather than simply I love you. And more recently, um, this would be the case of uh, Jean-Luc Nancy, uh, Nancy who has argued that being or existence must be more precisely articulated as être à or being to. So uh, what, what does this proposition, proposition do? Um, well, in, a, in these three cases, in, in Derrida, in uh, Ihikahai, and in Nancy, um, what the proposition does is to, to gesture to word and to maintain an openness to others. Okay? And, and in today's um, theoretical landscape or ecology, um, this, this, this notion of others is, is not just only human others, but also non-human others, such as animals, um, mineral and vegetable beings, climate, systems, uh, organic systems, in inorganic systems, which are <laughs> the focus of Niklas Luhmann's uh, systems theory. And in that light, one could also add um, the more recent object-oriented philosophy. Okay? And, and I would also add uh, contemporary queer theory in the likes of, say, John Paul Rico and, and uh, Lee Edelman. I would add, and I follow uh, Ihi Kahai and Nongsi here, that this preposition to, or this a, ah, marks as well a critical and respectful distance between oneself and the other. That is to say, this preposition to, or a, ah, does not go so far as to reach, to reach out and grasp the other in a kind of fixed bind. It does, not, it, it does not reduce the other into a kind of identification with oneself. It doesn't appropriate the other to oneself, or worse, to penetrate the other. So um, otherwise, otherwise, one has to tear away from sahashia, from, from that totalizing grasp or reach. So that's, that's preposition. But what about the preposition? Um, before, going, before going to the prepositional, one has, to add, uh, one has to acknowledge that theory oftentimes um, takes up a position or it positions itself, especially when politics is in question or at stake. And we saw the question of politics and theory yesterday. But I'll just give a few more examples. Um, for example, uh, Badiou. Uh, Badiou who has, um, uh, who wants to hold on to the communist hypothesis and therefore uh, rejecting, entertaining the possibility, any possibility of democratic thought. And in, in object-oriented philosophy, notably in Tim Morton's hyper-objects, okay, he wants to insist on global warming and rejecting the, the trope of climate change. Uh, and in Ihigahai, Ihigahai, who insists on the female subject in contrast and in opposition to the male object for the regeneration of the world. Okay, so I, I, I'm, not, I'm not categorically refusing um, uh, theory's positioning or the positions in theory. However, I would like to recall a certain Derridean moment in theory. That's to say, theory in its undecidability. Theory, um, when, it, when it dwells in, in the kind of auto-deconstruction of things and text, uh, or in short, in difficulties, in indifference and in deferment. And, and for me, difficulties, auto-deconstruction, um, undecidability are all moments of the prepositional. And I would say this is also the moment of reading, reading as prepositional. Now, if one, wants, one would want to insist on theory being political, one could ask is, can, can, can the prepositional be effectively political? I would say yes. And one would have to go back to Foucault. Foucault who has said that visibility is a trap. 
And for me, visibility is all about positions. That is to say, occupying a position that allows one to be localizable, to be located. Okay. And, and, and when Foucault made that statement, he was, he was pointing to a kind of totalizing politics that demand a presence of the political subjects, such that the governing structure could control and manage those political subjects. I wouldn't say that we are free from such a dispositive. Um, in fact, we might even be in the, at the height of such a dispositive, given today's enhanced global positioning, uh, GPS systems, drone technologies, cloud technologies. So we are more than ever localizable, visible, positioned. Now, Blanchot, in the wake of, of Foucault, would, would call for the right to disappear from such uh, totalizing politics. I'm not so sure about disappearance today. However, I would, I would say that there remain spaces, prepositional spaces, which we traverse almost every day. Right? And it's, it's in those prepositional spaces that we could imagine, or to return to the preposition, we could open ourselves to modes of resistance against such dispositive. And, and just to conclude, um, we spoke about the archive yesterday. And I would say that the archive, the, especially the archive of notes, um, are, 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 the tr are where the traces of the prepositional can be found. That's to say, um, that's where the trace, where one's forgetfulness of the umbrella can be found before one is positioned in a photograph with the umbrella. Thank you. Uh, with uh, five minutes, I guess I could only give a summary of a summary, but if one cannot uh, make anything clear in five minutes, one won't be able to make anything clear in 50 or 500 minutes either, so I'm going to try. I think the framing questions uh, for today, uh, this panel, uh, I take them to be to point to this uh, uh, question, what's the ultimate distinction of, uh, of theoretical thinking, of uh, critical uh, thinking? And I would like to address this uh, 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 question uh, in the following uh, uh, a manner. I would like to try to trace uh, the process in which a, a, a mode of thinking uh, transforms itself from pre-theoretical or the, uh, theoretical to something theoretical or critical. And uh, I think it's possible to pinpoint that point at which a quantitative change uh, reaches some s qualitative substance. And uh, this s transition from quantity to quality, I think, uh, would uh, uh, shed some light on uh, our uh, reflections on, on theory. For instance, uh, there are a lot of uh, modes of writing or thinking uh, or production uh, that are only or merely uh, quantitatively theoretical or critical. There are a certain dosage of theory or critique in it, but it's not qualitatively, substantively, or systematically uh, uh, theoretical. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one way to, uh, uh, by, by using this Hegelian uh, uh, notion of, uh, uh, the, of the transition from quantity to quality, uh, there's uh, it, it allow us to think through this issue of theory and critique. The other, uh, along with this uh, way of thinking, I think there we, we may also want to consider the different domains in which theory or critique is produced. For instance, um, uh, at the, the very beginning, we could say science in the broadest sci uh, uh, sense or knowledge itself is the domain of theory or critique. But quick, very quickly, uh, quickly, I mean, by several centuries, uh, uh, they, this domain loses its ability to maintain, to, to hold that intensity, that point of ultimate distinction. It quickly goes into something like philosophy, and rather than knowledge or science in general. But then very quickly, philosophy loses its control of, of theoretical or critical intensity. And uh, now we are at a, the stage that theory itself might lose, might not, might have 
stop being the, the domain for theoretical or critical thinking. So th that's something we all experience, I think, uh, in an empirical uh, sense that uh, a lot of uh, theoretical writings or discourses are ultimately untheoretical or uncritical. Uh, they are, uh, it, there's this immense uh, this possibility for one to think uncritically, untheoretically, while writing theoretical or critical uh, stuff. So this, and, and so we could uh, uh, ask uh, whether uh, the, uh, what are the possible domains in which theory or critique, its intensity, its quality, and uh, its substance can still be located and uh, produced? Uh, probably economics or politics or uh, maybe neuroscience, that's the, the new domain in which th true critical theoretical intensity is attainable today. So, and uh, for, for those who are familiar with uh, uh, political philosophy, you probably recognize already this formal resemblance between uh, Carl Schmitt's way of defining po the political, asking what's the ultimate distinction of the political, and that's the enemy def friend uh, distinction, and f f Schmidt regards the political as something that travels from domain to domain. The political sphere might be the most apolitical domain in, say, civil society, in uh, of democracy, whereas the seemingly apolitical domain of economy, of science, of religion, of value, of morality, all of a sudden achieves this uh, political intensity, right? So that formal resemblance, I think, c c might be a potent reminder of the, uh, a more substantive family resem resemblance between theory or critique as such and the politics as such. So that, that's my one, uh, the, my first point that I think to think theoretically means to think politically, but it's a sort of a almost ontologically defined uh, the political. It's a very dangerous move because critical theory uh, usually resists that kind of a ontological thinking, but when it comes to the political, I think theory or crit critique, it must be considered inherently, uh, qualitatively uh, political, and that remains a core feature or distinction of, of theory. The second point I want to make is uh, that uh, for one to start thinking critically or theoretically, one is already dealing with this issue of, uh, of contradiction. Uh, it's an old friend, but, uh, but I want to uh, revive this uh, discourse of a contradiction, uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, notion of unity of opposites, uh, the possibility of change as internally produced by, by things, by uh, historical processes, and, uh, and a contradiction uh, uh, in, in theoretically, uh, 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 theoretically comprehended uh, must be understood as a structure of contradictions. Uh, this, I refer to the Maoist notion of contradiction, which was reflected upon by Althusser by, 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 and by others. So it's not a kind of a simple notion of a contradiction of paradox, but rather a structure of overdetermination. There are major aspects of contradiction as opposed to minor aspects of contradiction. There are uh, main contradiction as opposed to minor cons construction. They all coexist and occupy the same space. And to think through that, the, the space of a, uh, of a, a multiplicity is the beginning at the point of departure of theory and, and the critique. That's, that's my, my third point is, uh, is materialism. And uh, since this audience, uh, this conference is, uh, uh, the, given its, uh, its, uh, 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 its own distinction, I think uh, we don't have to go into any, delve into any detail save to say that uh, theory or critique continues to mean critique of ideology and, uh, and, uh, and uh, this continual uh, a fight against uh, uh, illusions or conventions, all these uh, uh, unreflected assumptions. And to that extent, uh, materialism as a great philosophical and uh, uh, intellectual tradition, uh, I think, uh, continues to uh, occupy the, the, the uh, uh, define the centrality of, uh, of theory. With that, if I could take one more minute, 
uh, well, I want to mention the, this is from yesterday's dis discussion, the sort of the, the prehistory or the, the genealogy, the origin of uh, theory slash critique as a, as a body of knowledge or as a mode of intellectual uh, uh, production. This, I think, uh, uh, actually this is it. This is the, uh, the, 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 the little thing I wrote for, for this conference, but uh, I decided to rather to provide a summary of this. Uh, I think by that genealogy, I want to quickly mention, uh, in the spirit of drawing a list, someone uh, raised this question. I think theory, uh, it's very easy for contemporary theory to forget uh, uh, its its origin, uh, its prehistory, or its genealogy. Whereas for someone who uh, became exposed to theory in China in the 80s, in the immediate uh, post-revolutionary years, uh, somehow we were like the nomads in Kafka's little essay on the Great Wall of China. Mm -hmm. uh, because the nomads roaming around, they actually saw the Great Wall in its totality, whereas the Chinese, the emperor, and the, the ministers only built the Great Wall section by section, and the, you know they were admired under the, the bureaucracy and all that, and the, and the lost sight of the, of this. Uh, I think uh, for a Chinese student in the 80s coming to theory, uh, it's. Uh, uh, it's impossible to forget that uh, uh, it came from this late 19th century, early 20th century struggle to maintain a human science, a Geisteswissenschaft, vis-a-vis -vis the, the, uh, the, the fragmentation of experience, uh, the reification, technology, the science, uh, all that commodification. So this, uh, the notion of, uh, of an integrated human science uh, uh, for someone like me uh, is part of this uh, uh, machine uh, producing theory. Once we lose sight of that, it stops being theoretical in the sort of a, in a very personal but also very uh, political or fundamental uh, sense. The, the next thing I want to uh, mention is, uh, oh, with that, the, the great human hermeneutic tradition, the, you know, uh, from Deotai to uh, Schleiermacher to, to, uh, to Paul Ricoeur, uh, this is a great tradition of, uh, of learning. Uh, the, the end of the varying discourse of rationality vis-a-vis -vis the so-called the quarrels or controversies among gods. We are still dealing with this in this with renewed intensity, uh, religious fundamentalism, the clash of civilizations, and so on and so forth. And that does not seem to be uh, reduced or uh, done away with by by uh, uh, by rationality. And then the entire Marx, Western Marxist canon, including Frankfurt School, post-war French Marxism, and so on and so forth. Then the psychoanalytical movement, and then the various linguistic formalist schools, and then the crucial link between theory and the philosophy. Uh, it's a very old-fashioned term, but uh, in non-Western world, theory is still entangled with this thing called the philosophy. Uh, Heidegger, Wittgenstein, and then through Marxism mainly, uh, Hegel and Kant and beyond. So I mean, there are, there are more things I want to mention, but I will stop here. Uh, so to the cut-dry list uh, answer to the framing questions is this. Uh, a theory as a mode of production, I think, will have to entail at least the three principles I mentioned. That is the uh, uh, politics, uh, contradiction, uh, and materialism. Without which theory, uh, it's hard for me to imagine theory uh, to be anything vaguely theoretical or, or critical. Then there are four interventions that uh, address the, the more technical uh, features of, uh, of theory as a mode of writing. Uh, that is the, uh, the, the so-called uh, subject, uh, subjective intervention agency. You, know, you have to have this motivation, the impulse, you know, desire, passion to be theoretical, to be critical. Uh, the second is this construction of concepts and uh, 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 this, this conceptual or theoretical discourses. The third one is this methodological intervention. But methodology mean is not something purely formal or technical, but rather goes into this materialist uh, tradition. Uh, f that, for that, I think uh, one of the good examples of recent theoretical writing is Frederick James's Brecht and the Method, in which he addresses this issue of methodology as something to be 
articulated, formulated through the thing itself, even going as far as referring to the Taoist tradition of going with the flow of nature, and ancient Chinese philosophy, and so on and so forth. The finally, the fourth intervention is, I would, before yesterday, I came prepared to, to, to say the linguistic, or the, the, symbol, the imaginary symbolic intervention, that's a Lacanian notion, but after uh, yesterday's lecture by Professor Malibu, I, would, I decided to call it the, the neuro linguistic <laughs> intervention, working with the medium, with language, with form, with, you know, the appearance in today's uh, uh, sense. Sorry about uh, taking so, so long. <laughs> well, good morning, everybody. How is everybody doing on a scale of one to 10? I am at <laughs> I am excited, delighted, and symptomatically happy, so I'm really, uh, <laughs> as you can tell, uh, thank you for coming out on a Saturday morning, and um, I'm really happy to be here. Thank you to you know, our dean and to my dear, inestimable colleague, Julia Lupton, Amanda Swine, all the other people in the library, all the invisible hands that made it possible, a heartfelt uh, thank you ontologically, politically, and every other way <laughs> you can think of. Um, and, uh, and it's a pleasure to be in this panel. And Horacio, thank you for uh, moderating. I love your work. Anytime at a meeting you have something to say, I listen very carefully. I really appreciate it. And what you said about the sublime yesterday, I thought it was right on. And a special thank you to Catherine Malibu. Uh, why aren't you lecturing today also? I mean, <laughs> three days of uh, stirring lectures was absolutely invigorating. Thank you so very much. I guess, again, neurally, cerebrally, every which way, cortically from both the left and right side of the brain. Okay, if I'm not being too undemocratic, I want to share with you in about 10, 12 minutes. If it's too much, just share an object at me and just physically stop me and I'll stop. Uh, some of my anxieties as well as my high points about theory, and I'm kind of responding to the questions posed and riffing off of that. Question one, recognition and recognizability. Immediately, by whom, for whom, scale of recognition, this room, state, nation, global, planetary. Interesting questions of scale. Uh, especially in a world that is relentlessly structured in dominance and remains asymmetrical and uneven. An example, a month ago, the world, and I think the world does not know it, lost a great Tamil writer whose works I have had the privilege of translating, and his name is Jack Anthony. And years ago, in a conversation with him, somebody asked him, uh, Jay Kantan, have you read Jean Paul Sartre? And he came right back at you. Part of it was being churlish, maybe resentment. Mm. But the question is, you ask me, sir, have I read Jean Paul Sartre? I ask you, has Jean Paul Sartre read Jay Kantan? And it's an interesting thing to keep in mind. Maybe it's personal peak, mm. but honestly, how many of us know here who Jay Kantan is? And God knows he deserves the Nobel Prize over and over and over and over again. Ad infinitum. It's a pity. And again, thinking of the conference in Johns Hopkins, which is hugely influential, and I'm, I'm deeply indebted to it, but there were other conjunctural events. Bandung, 1955. 1962, our own Gogi Watiango in a conference in Africa discussing the relevance of language English language to African literature. So I'm not suggesting that in a, in a kind of a movement of you know, contrapuntal peak or resentment, but the question I want to raise is the relationship between some kind of centrism, whatever that means, Euro, Afro, Andro, Gyno, or centrism as such a la Derrida, and how we move from there towards something like a relational, perspectival universality and perspectival simultaneously Nietzschean, but to me, my main man, still Maurice Merleau-Ponty. And how do we make a distinction between centrism as something virulent and as just a point of entry? You know, we got to be who we are. And I think the book that dealt with it to me brilliantly is Said's Freud and the Non-European. Okay, uh, point uh, number two. The question of is it recognized as theory? 
the distinction between something called an intrinsic value and valorization as a very particular act of monetization. I remember an early essay by, by Barbara Christian called The Race for Theory. And, and many things I wouldn't agree with her, but the question she was raising is morphology. You know, there is the trickster figure, the griot, the storyteller, the sutradhar in Sanskrit drama, the Kattian garden in Tamil street theater, the whole question of what is the work of theory and when is it actually identified, taxonomized officially as theory, that is a non-trivial question. Now, the moment you get a recognition, you know, it, it's a basic uh, truth, immediately question of self and other. So along with recognition come questions of reciprocity. Reciprocity and antagonism, reciprocity and contrapuntality, and all of these things need to be negotiated all at the same time. So recognition is philosophical, ontological, specifically taxonomic, official, unofficial, partly archeological, partly genealogical, partly subjugated knowledges, as Foucault would have it, at the intersection of archeology span and genealogy. Now, next I move to Raymond Williams. I think Guy through the mentioned her yesterday. Uh, the distinction he makes between a project and a formation. And the book posthumously published, I love that story of a student coming and knocking on the door, hey teacher, hey teacher, leave them kids alone, we don't need no edu, I won't get into that. Okay, I love Pink Floyd still. Uh, but, and the teacher knocks on the door, hey teacher, do you have an answer? Teacher, oh my God, not in my discipline. Get out, go to your next discipline. And then, I have no answer here. The teacher says, get the hell out. The whole question of, in some way, the answer is out already there. So if you think of it as, what is the site of knowledge, inside, outside universities, I want to keep that in mind. And of course, the point that Raymond Williams is making is, on the one hand, acknowledging the formation of the mediation, but insisting on some kind of an ongoing organic alignment with the project, the movement out there, and the institution responding. And the other pole is the great moment in the early Derrida when he talks about you know, the university and the eye of its pupils. How do you realize the university as a site where you can think thought itself? So this relationship between you know, Roland Barthes said, to write intransitive. How do you create a meaningful, non-reductive, non-doctrinaire relationship between uh, thought intransitive but making sure at the same time that when thought thinks itself, was somebody even there? And if somebody wasn't even there, was there a thought? But how can that thought thinking about itself be made to spill over as an actual effect on an actual movement, a position, a revolution? And how do you bring those two together? And in the context of that, some of the debates used to be, is theory a James Dean, a rebel without a cause? What happens when theory takes on a cause? Does it become plumpus denken? Does it become vulgar? Or is the purpose of theory both to have a cause and in the act of having a cause, transform what it means to have a cause? It's like you're playing a game. How can you not play a game? But in playing a game, changing the game itself, the moment when the meta becomes useful. Uh, the debates, for example, about postmodernism. Uh, as initially seen as postmodernism on we, male narcissistic, Eileen Siksu talking about building monuments to lack, and then in come Nancy Fraser, Linda Nicholson, postmodern feminism, African American feminism, and the whole question of cathexis, the whole moment of taking on something called agency without making the political a mere reductive phenomenon. So there's the, the whole question of if the question is, uh, is theory always already political? And I think I love the moment Hillis Miller was saying, when I was doing my dissertation, you just said, I'm doing a theory dissertation. It meant you were simultaneously local and translocal, and that hubris is often unearned. So maybe we'll want to come back to that if one were to intervene simultaneously in the game and at the same time transform it, what kind of a game would that be? It could be democracy, it could be human rights. Um, okay. Uh, Talking about modes of recognition, I'm just stringing a few uh, you know, in an episodic kind of way. I hope it's not too inchoate. Uh, there's a moment in Amitav Ghosh's wonderful book, The Shadow Lines, where recognition is simultaneously a window and a mirror. 
So under what conditions do you look at yourself, mirror, mirror, tell me whatever, and that self-reflexivity does not become narcissistic or solipsistic, but actually becomes a window. And when does the window become, you look at the window and you see yourself. Whoa, that's bizarre. You look at the mirror and you don't see yourself but the world, but I'm looking at recognition and I'm insisting on that, and A.K. Ramanujan has written about that, but the, the interchangeability of the window mode of recognition and the mirror mode, and the reason I'm harping on that is to ensure that different as we are in the one world, that there is, a, a, there is an attempt to honor secular co-evilness rather than you know, the first world, second world, third world, that ruinous uh, track. Um, okay, then in terms of, uh, okay, the dangers of instantiation, I'm referring to uh, what happens when you, uh, you know, is this theory, is that theory? And I think that's not the way to go. Because once you instantiate, something is non-instantiated. When something is exemplary, this is exemplary theory. The non-exemplary becomes either privatized on this refused currency, and clearly that is not the way to go. There must be some other way. Then in terms of particular words, uh, are you still with me? If it's, you know, if it's boring, you need to let me know. I'll, I'll get down. I'm thinking of, would you, would you say, I'm sorry? You don't really want to just say boring. <laughs> well, or some other euphemism, you know. I'm, 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 you know I'm, the distinction between critique and critical consciousness, uh, and I think Saeed made that move, uh, what is at stake? So when you are doing critical, is a person speaking, a system speaking, a procedure speaking, a discourse speaking, and I think those need to be talked about. And simultaneously, uh, if you're looking for theory, uh, is it okay to say the theory is a pharmacon? The position that the remedy is the cure itself, is that satisfactory or is it not? Uh, and then, uh, let me stop with this. Um, the idea then of uh, how do we know indeed that something is you know, a critical or not, something is oppositional or not? I think there are some questions to be asked. In our own time and place, how do we make a distinction between theory as I saying and theory as nay saying? Does one result in the other or the two discontinuous practices? Or how do we know can we speak truth to power or have notions like ideology critique, have they become obsolete? And I think what I'm concerned about in the works of many people whom I respect and admire, that increasingly theory might have become, and I'm not being in any way nostalgic, an ability to be progressively, comprehensively, sophisticatedly, in an erudite way, acquiesce in the symptom, rather than do something about it. Maybe this is a naive way, enjoy the symptom, the symptom speaks. So I'll, I'll end up the whole question of positionality, uh, maybe you can go back to Gramsci, and I think Catherine Malibu's talk talked about multiple insides and outsides. How real are they? Are they ontological fictions, epistemological crutches? Are they trompe things you know, that really are there? But to what extent can we think of the constitutive outside as in some sense authorizing, but in some sense always already constituted as well? So positionality becomes important. And finally, I want to go back to the, in the question that uh, Hara, you know, he, well, the question he asked about the sublime. Uh, you know, uh, you know, what are the the Anthropocene? Uh, it's if if it's uh, against these that we are, you know, struggling. Seems to me theory has at least two traditions, many, many more. One would be, you know, eco-sensitive. Maybe Gelassenheit, maybe Martin Heidegger. Let things be. John Keats, negative capability. Virginia Woolf. But on the other hand, the Marxian dictum to know things is to change, and change is always violent. And I think Merleau-Ponty says you just choose what kind of violence. So in the context of those two imperatives, one is you got to change it, and change never is innocuous. But on the other hand, letting be, in that context, where does the imprimatur fall? In the name of what is action to be done? And this is absolutely final. Uh, I'm referring to theory and jargon. I'm thinking of the cover of Saeed's posthumously published book, you know, where it says, Admit All. So who is theory for? Clearly, it's not jargon, but it has to be complexity, not dumbed down, but the kind of complexity which is democratic and admits all, but there's a problem. But who said admit all? That the all are already here, so who is saying it? With which random, uh, inchoate words, 
Thank you so much, and I'd be grateful for questions, comments, and thanks again for a magnificent conference.